On today's show, Jaguar announces a race series for the iPACE EV. Mercedes-Benz becomes the first automaker to produce a plug-in hydrogen hybrid electric car. And a Nissan Leaf drives to Mongolia with a panda on board. These stories and more coming up next. This is Ecotricity's Ecotech Roundup show from New Zealand's only Carbon Zero certified renewable electricity company. We're 100% Kiwi and 49% community owned. Switch today at ecotricity.co.nz. Hi there, I'm Nikki Gordon-Bloomfield, a professional musician turned electric vehicle crusader, and I'm here to bring Kiwis our weekly roundup of the biggest news stories around the world in relation to cleaner, greener transport. As always, thanks for joining me. British firm Jaguar has really been focusing hard on plug-in vehicles lately, entering the Formula E race series and preparing for its first ever electric car, the Jaguar I-Pace crossover SUV, for a market launch next year. This week in Frankfurt, the brand went one step further, announcing a brand new Arrive and Drive championship called the I-Pace E-Trophy due to be held between qualifying and race proper of each of the fifth season of Formula E races, the iPACE e-trophy will see up to 20 race-prepared iPACE cars face off in short 30-minute events. It'll not only entertain Formula E fans, but it's also a great way to refine the iPACE for production late next year and get some serious publicity points in for the bargain. It's a very, very clever move. I maybe should have noted this at the top of today's show, but if you wondered why there wasn't a show last week, it was because I was on my way back home after attending the official world premiere of the 2018 Leaf electric car. With an expected EPA range of 150 miles per charge, that's around 241 kilometers, the new 2018 Nissan Leaf isn't going to win the range wars. But it's priced less than the outgoing Leaf, and Nissan hopes that its lower price will offer enough range to get more people behind the wheel of an electric car for the first time. Sadly, I didn't get a chance to drive it, but so far I'm impressed. The highest-end Nissan Leaf also comes with an optional semi-autonomous technology package courtesy of Nissan's ProPilot, and for those who are willing to wait, there's a longer-range, higher-performance version due in about a year's time. Watch this space. Aside from Tesla unlocking the full capacity of customers' software-limited Model S and Model X 60 kWh battery packs last week so that they could escape Hurricane Irma, the most important thing that makes Tesla Model S, Model X and Model 3 ownership so pleasant is Tesla's global network of supercharger stations. After all, they offer a convenient and quick way to refuel your Tesla without having to worry about RFID cards, membership subscriptions or any of the other headaches associated with non-Tesla DC quick charging. Traditionally, Tesla has focused its superchargers along major highways outside of urban areas, except curiously in London. But this week, Tesla unveiled a new, more compact supercharger design called the Urban Supercharger, specifically for use in tight spaces in major cities. Sure, it's not as powerful, it maxes out at 70 kilowatts, but Tesla hopes to use the new Urban Supercharger to help customers in large cities refuel their Teslas without having to venture miles into the burbs to do so. While I personally prefer battery electric vehicles over hydrogen fuel cell cars, I've long maintained that plug-in hydrogen fuel cell cars, where a large battery pack is supplemented by a fuel cell operating as a range extender, would be a far better choice for the future than a plug-in hybrid with an internal combustion engine. And this week, finally, the first vehicle to ever make use of a plug-in hydrogen hybrid drivetrain was announced. Meet the Mercedes-Benz GLC F-Cell, a zero tailpipe emission variant of the GLC GLC, which, when it goes into limited production in two years, will offer an all-electric range of around 30 miles before its fuel cell will need to turn on to add extra range. It's a good idea in theory, but it's a heavy ride with a limited top speed of just 100 miles per hour and a whole load of expensive tech on board. Will it catch on? Well, not in the private market, but I can see fleets going absolutely gaga about it. Another vehicle that will get fleets excited is the Daimler Fuso Ecanter electric truck, which the firm announced is about to enter into series production and will be available across Europe, Asia and the US. With a payload of £10,000, that's about 4,553 kilos and a range of 60 miles, 100 kilometers, it might seem a little limited in its performance, but as it happens, that's more than enough for most inner city delivery routes, where a zero emissions truck would fit the bill perfectly. Although official production is just beginning, the Fuso e Canter is already scheduled to head to Japan, where 7 Eleven have committed to purchasing 25 units for use as delivery vehicles in and around 
Tokyo. And with Tesla quietly pushing the launch of its highly anticipated Tesla Semi back by a month this week, it seems that Daimler may have the upper hand this time. Sticking with the Daimler family one last time this show, I've got to mention the all-new Mercedes-Benz EQA compact crossover concept that debuted this week in Frankfurt. Supposedly previewing the new A-Class-sized EV that we can expect to see from the brand in about two years' time, the EQA promises around 200 miles, 320 kilometers of real-world driving, a 5-second 0-60 sprint time, super-fast next-generation CCS-DC quick-charging capabilities, and wireless inductive charging as standard. Fitting below the EQ concept SUV we saw last year, the EQA does appear to fit the bill nicely, but as always, we won't know for sure how serious Benz is until we see it in the flesh on dealer lots. And because some of you asked me to, Mercedes-Benz also unveiled its AMG Project One hypercar in Frankfurt this week, which combines a 1.6-litre V6 with all-wheel drive quad motor electric action in a super-fast Formula One-inspired car that will cost a cool $2.8 million. Enough said. Staying with Frankfurt, Volkswagen unveiled its refreshed version of the ID Cross electric concept SUV there this week, as well as announcing a doubling down on its commitment to electric cars, promising to supplement an earlier 10 billion euro commitment with an expanded budget of 70 billion by 2030, just so that it can do what it takes to become a world leader in electric cars. Interestingly, 50 billion of that is slated to be spent exclusively on battery technology, but with very little to show for it thus far even if the latest ID Cross concept looks far more ready for market than the one we saw six months ago, Volkswagen is going to have to do a whole lot more work before many take it seriously in a post-Dieselgate world. And if that wasn't enough, on Thursday, Volkswagen announced its participation in a 36 million euro autonomous vehicle pilot program across Europe. While finances are still low for the company, it's clear that it really is pushing as hard as it can for its survival. So it's going to be interesting to see just what happens next. Volkswagen's luxury brand Audi also had a fair bit to share in Frankfurt this week, debuting not one but two autonomous vehicle concepts, the Icon and the Elaine. While the names are a little bit bizarre, the Icon is a distant future vision of what an autonomous car could be, ditching traditional driver control devices in a futuristic, far-off tone that's more Blade Runner than anything else. Meanwhile, the Elaine, with its 370 kilowatt all-wheel drive electric drivetrain and 95 kilowatt hour battery pack is supposedly a preview of a level 4 autonomous vehicle Audi hopes to bring to market in the near future. There's no word on pricing, but if it does reach production, it's going to be quite the looker. It's probably one of the most iconic cars ever made, is instantly recognizable around the world, and as rumor would have it, is one of the reasons the UK decided to institute speed limits on motorways that were previously unrestricted back in the 1960s. When it launched, the E-Type Jaguar was powered by the famous inline six known as the XK. But now, thanks to the clever folks at Jaguar Land Rover's classic car division, it's been reborn as a high-performance all-electric model. There's a 40 kilowatt hour battery pack, some 170 miles of range, and more than 200 kilowatts at your disposal. But sadly, this is a one-off vehicle built to preview Jaguar Land Rover's commitment to electric cars. But knowing it exists is just enough to to make me want to drive it. I wonder if they'll let me. And finally, if I had a pound or a dollar every time someone told me that electric cars were only good in the urban jungle, I'd be pretty rich by now. But now, when someone tells me that sad old tale, I can tell them about Chris and Julie Ramsey, aka Plug-in Adventures, who've just successfully completed the Mongol Rally in a Nissan Leaf. Yep, you heard me. London to Mongolia in a Nissan Leaf. Not only did they make some amazing friends along the way, but proved that electric cars are here to stay, can do whatever you want them to, and raised money for WWF Scotland to boot. You can even head to the Plugin Adventures website to donate now if you haven't yet. Oh, and my third side has to give a shout out to the panda mascot who accompanied Chris on the trip. Looking good, buddy. Looking good. Yes. 
And on that note, it's time for me to bring another episode to a close. And don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. Tell your friends about the show. And if you've got some feedback, be sure to send it our way. As always, I'll be back soon with more Ecotech goodness. So make sure you hit that notification bell to find out the minute a new show is uploaded. In the meantime, enjoy your weekend, make sure you do something fun, and don't forget to help keep those wind turbines spinning by switching to New Zealand's only Carbon Zero certified renewable electricity company. As always, thanks for joining me. I'm Nikki Gordon-Bloomfield. Kakite, see you next time. 